30 seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 advisory group. We are a collaboration among about 70 groups in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the beginnings of American independence. And our guest today is Dr. Jonathan D. Sarna, who is a university professor, as well as the Joseph H. and Bell R. Brown Professor of American Jewish History, and also director of the Schlusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Sarnar. I'll call it's you Jonathan. Really a pleasure to uh, be and with you. Professor Sarnar. Uh, oh. I really want to thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, to appear here. The revolution is a perennial interest. It certainly is. And you've talked about it in a couple of places. I, I will talk a little bit about your books, but you're also, uh, you are the chief historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, as well as a, uh, but you've written, written, co-written, co-edited more than 30 books. And um, American Judaism, a history is a, has a chapter on Jews and the revolution. Of course, you've also written about the civil war with a uh, book about Lincoln, a book about Grant, a book about the Jews of Boston, which I know well. Also, you've written about the Jewish community in Cincinnati, where you taught for a number of years. And uh, so we'll be talking about some of these books, but we really want to talk about Jews in America at the time of the revolution. So can you tell us, you know, how many people are we talking about? Where were they? Sure. I, it's a very small community. Uh, the minimalists say 1,500. The maximalists say 3,000. We're talking about uh, uh, far fewer than one in a 1,000. But what's very significant is that they were not distributed across the, the colonies. They basically uh, were in port cities. So um, uh, Savannah, Charleston, Philadelphia, New York, Newport, uh, mm -hmm. and then Baltimore and Richmond are really formed as Jewish communities just uh, in this era. But the historic colonial communities are those five port cities. And in each of them, including Philadelphia, there is a significant uh, Jewish presence, and certainly as uh, supporters of the revolution um, come to Philadelphia, often from other places, they uh, naturally interact uh, with Jews. And for a brief time, uh, Philadelphia becomes the largest Jewish community uh, in uh, North America because uh, Jews from New York and Jews uh, from uh, Savannah and elsewhere uh, gravitated towards uh, uh, towards Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And where had they come from? What uh, parts of the world did these folks come from to America? So um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, some of the most uh, famous were what we call Sephardic Jews, Jews from originally mm -hmm. from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, they'd been expelled uh, from Spain and then uh, from Portugal at the very end of the 15th century. Uh, but many make their way to Holland. From there, some come to the Caribbean, uh, and also some come to North America. But by the time of the American Revolution, we also had what are called Ashkenazi Jews, Jews from the German lands. And it's interesting that the revolution itself uh, contributes to the number of 
German-speaking Jews. Germany isn't united until the 1870s. But among the Hessian troops uh, who come uh, to or come to fight on the side of the British are uh, some Jews, especially uh, in positions like uh, uh, settlers, people who uh, um, uh, are feeding uh, the troops and making arrangements uh, for the troops. Um, and, uh, you know, an army then and now moves on its stomach. And uh, so uh, um, uh, we know that some of them uh, were Jews and later they stayed. And I guess the fact that they had uh, been Hessians and on the British side wasn't sufficient to drive them out um, after independence was uh, was declared. So you had a rich mix of Jews from different places, and they all had to try somehow and live together within a tiny community and even worship together, even though they came from hmm. somewhat different places and traditions. And figuring that out was not a small matter. Um, uh, especially in Philadelphia, when they founded uh, the synagogue in Philadelphia, which is going to be important mikveh Israel, um, and in the revolution, it has very prominent members. We actually have a letter to the founders, and it was one of the Gratz family members. And the question was, well, what's our custom going to be? And he says, well, hmm. let's call it the American custom because. We, we uh, you know, have to find a way. What he was hinting at is uh, we, we, we have to give something to everybody. They didn't quite do that, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. it's clear that uh, they made room for a wide variety of people uh, from different backgrounds because that's what America was. It was true in the general community. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who is this American, this new man Krevker is going uh, right. to ask? And his description uh, could equally have applied, who is an American Jew? And mm -hmm. he, that, that they came uh, from all these different places, married one another, and had to create something that hadn't been seen before. Interesting. Very interesting. And of course, now our minds are very much on Israel being at war, Jews fighting, and you mentioned Jews being part of the Hessian forces. What about serving in the American arm, army? So we know of about a hundred uh, Jews who serve in different capacities. Um, there there, there seems to have been a, a group of Jews, um, and, and they were known uh, 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 as Jews uh, in Charleston, um, which was a significant community. Um, they, what's important, I think, is not just the Jews fought, although they were very proud later of having shed blood for the revolution, but in America, Jews could move up on the basis of their merit. And we know there were Jewish colonels and other mm -hmm. Jews who moved up in the military. Um, that was not true in most of the world because uh, there was a taboo on how could a Jew give orders to a Christian? Even the British army didn't allow them to move up at that time. And of course, uh, where the majority of Jews lived, which was in the Russian Empire at that time, uh, they were basically cannon fodder, not allowed uh, uh, to do anything uh, of authority, which helps to explain why Jews in the Russian army tried to evade uh, military service. Uh, they weren't uh, allowed mm -hmm to serve the way others were. 
Hmm. Interesting. And I know uh, recently there's been a very exciting discovery in Savannah about a man named Mordecai Shepta. Can you tell us a bit yeah. about this? Let, yes, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about it. It's not in my book. Uh, we, of course, knew that uh, uh, the Shefto family was uh, prominent in Savannah. That is uh, an Ashkenazi family, the one of the two major families in, in Jewish families in Savannah. And we knew that uh, the Sheftels, both the father and the son, Mordecai Sheftel and Sheftel Sheftel, uh, were taken prisoner. But now uh, they pulled up a boat uh, that had been sunk in the American Revolution. It was somewhere off the coast of Savannah. And lo and behold, on the boat was the diary of a minister named Reverend Moses Allen. And they were, as you now can, they were able to sort of uh, get the water out of the diary and began reading it. And in 1778, he described how the prisoners had pork for dinner. And then he went on. The Jews, Mr. Sheftel and son, refused to eat their pieces and their knives and forks were ordered to be greased with it, um, meaning that they, uh, uh, in those days, prisoners would bring their own knives and forks, and the British holding them prisoner uh, made it deeply uncomfortable for them to eat uh, the food served, uh, which as Jews, they weren't prepared to eat. But listen to Reverend Allen, who is himself a prisoner, it is a happiness that Mr. Sheftel is a fellow sufferer. He bears it with such fortitude as an example to me. Uh, so we, we never before had this kind of data on a, a Jewish prisoner of war, nor did we realize that there were uh, troops in the British army who who really used kind of primitive religious warfare uh, in uh, mm -hmm. trying to break the spirit of uh, of the American uh, 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 of of the American revolutionary troops. So um, it's mm. interesting and interesting that even now, so many years later, you can still um, uh, have a brand new find. Yeah, it's amazing what we're still learning about the revolution and about other things. We're talking with Jonathan Sarna, who is a university professor and the Joseph and Bell Braun Professor of American Jewish History at Brandeis, author of a number of books, including American Judaism, A History. And we're talking about Jews in the American Revolution. And here we're talking about the some of the men who served, including the Sheftels, who were both taken prisoner during the at the capture of Savannah and inspire then Reverend Moses Allen and others to fortitude in their common struggle. Um, probably one of the best known Jewish figures at the, in the time of the revolution is Haim Solomon. And I don't think we can avoid saying something about his role in this. Sure. Uh, Haim Solomon uh, was actually a Polish Jew uh, from a place called Lissa. And um, uh, as you say, he's probably the best known Jew. I, his genius was lay in his ability generally to market goods. Uh, there was a recent study of the advertisements that Chaim Solomon put in newspapers. And uh, he was a kind of pioneer. He had an instinct for how to market. But particularly important was his role in marketing what were then called bills of exchange, which are roughly similar to modern checks. Uh, if you have funds somewhere else, you wanted your money available uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, Solomon knew many languages, um, uh, especially French, and we know the French soldiers uh, used him 
uh, and the Spanish soldiers used him. So he becomes a, a kind of leading broker. And that, of course, catches the attention of Robert Morris, superintendent of finance. It's quite fascinating to look at Robert Morris's diary. In the beginning, he says, the Jew, Chaim Solomon, came to see me. But then he got to know Chaim Solomon and, of course, realized how successful and important he was. Mm -hmm. And later on, he talks about Mr. Solomon came to see me. And that shift uh, mm. in language wow. is very yeah. subtle, but telling how the two forged a relationship. And in 1781, uh, Solomon basically becomes the bill broker, uh, or certainly the principal one for mm. uh, Morris. And um, uh, he markets. I, I once said he was the first Jewish junk bond dealer, and the junk bonds were the bonds of the new nation. And uh, uh, Chaim Solomon must have been uh, very persuasive uh, because uh, he did manage um, uh, to bring in uh, money. Um exactly whether he loaned the government money, as was later claimed. Most scholars think that uh, was uh, exaggerated. Rather, um, uh, it was his role moving money in and out of his account mm -hmm. and sharing it, making it available that was important. Um, he also does loan money to various founding fathers uh, come to Philadelphia for the Constitution, uh, you know, they got Virginia money, not right. Philadelphia. Yeah. He will, um, uh, he'll make it available. And he mm -hmm. did it apparently um, uh, on an interest-free basis uh, because of his patriotic uh, leanings. Uh, he had, according to tradition, which is a strong mm -hmm. tradition, he broke out of a British prison one of those according to the tradition one of those jewish hessians found that there was a jewish prisoner they spoke to one another in a language they both understood and before you knew it chaim solomon was out of prison mm -hmm. and in philadelphia but in any case um uh he dies uh he he helps build the synagogue in philadelphia it's the first one that's built um and organizes a Jewish charity and even sends some money back to his relatives in, uh, in Poland. Um, uh, and he's an example of someone who rather rapidly during this period moves from rags to riches. Uh, but he dies uh, uh, in mm -hmm. 1785. And as was true of many, many people, uh, in this very turbulent period, um, uh, by the time they settled the estate, uh, he was the family was sort of left bankrupt and rather bitter. Uh, what would happen is that that wow. the value of different monies mm -hmm. and so on would collapse, and they tried for many years to get the government mm. to to uh, help them. Hmm. Wow. Uh, Aaron Lopez is another character who loses a fortune in the revolution. I mean, Robert Morris loses a fortune too, but can you tell right. us about... And also ends up back... Yeah. Aaron Lopez um, actually is a fascinating figure. He comes directly from the Iberian Peninsula to Newport, hmm. which has a big uh, community in Newport, more than some of the others had Jews who sided with the British. We now mm. know that Lopez for a while played both sides, but eventually, mm. um, and it made sense, he was the probably the largest merchant, period, in Newport, mm. and extremely wealthy. Uh, during uh, the revolution, he leaves um, uh, uh, Newport, um, 
I think he comes to Leicester, he comes to Massachusetts, and, and we have mm. a remarkable uh, letter in which he described uh, what he's been hearing of how the people of Newport were treated uh, during the British uh, occupation of Newport. Um, it wasn't pretty. Um, Lopez uh, loses a lot of money. After the revolution, he's making his way back to Newport to try and rebuild, and he drowns. Um, uh, now, that's good for historians because there are huge numbers of Lopez mm. papers which were put together to try and figure out who owed what to whom. Um, mm. uh, terrible, of course, for the Lopez family. And the truth is that um, not only did the family never recover, but uh, within 50 years of uh, the revolution, uh, Newport pretty well shuts down as a Jewish community. And it's uh, it, it was built, uh, it was a free port and built on trade uh, with England, and they never were able to recover economically uh, from the revolution. Maybe Aaron Lopez would have found a way to do it. He was also involved in in spermaceti and uh, other things but yeah. uh, in any case that's the story of the great um uh, aaron aaron lopez and the reverend ezra styles of great fame who was in newport before he becomes mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yale, memorializes uh aaron lopez and you really see how much he mm -hmm. respected him again that such an important protestant divine in his diary, mm. writes a whole page about Aaron Lopez. Wow. Tells you something. Wow. Yeah. It certainly does. We're, we're talking with Jonathan Sarna from uh, Brandeis University. And of course, since we're on the subject of Newport, one of the most famous letters in American history is the one that George Washington writes to the Toro Synagogue. I think we could, it's a <laughs> remarkable letter. Where he talks about uh, a government which gives to bigotry no sanction to persecution no assistance and requires only that the only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens it's a remarkable it's, statement by the it, first president it's absolutely remarkable and i remind you that it precedes the passage of the first amendment um uh uh jews knew from long experience that what mattered were not just words but you know what the leader said and did the leader and mm -hmm. so yes. uh george washington comes uh to newport not to visit jews george washington had boycotted rhode island uh his first time traveling in new england because rhode island didn't sign on to the constitution um and uh he let it be known, though, that if they would sign on, remember, he wanted it to be unanimous. Uh, new, they, of course, were very nervous yeah. about it as a small state. Uh, they do eventually sign on, and George Washington, we know he never told a lie, but George Washington then, um, with Thomas Jefferson and others, does come to Rhode Island. He comes to Newport as per uh, the custom of the day, the whole bunch of public speeches are read out to George Washington. Most of them are, we have them are formal and not interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the Jews use the opportunity to really ask him, um, uh, 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 how are we going to be uh, 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 treated? And um, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, that line um, about bigotry, no sanction is actual, and persecution, no assistance, actually in their letter to him. And he then slightly mm -hmm. improved the phrasing and sends it back, which means yes. a lot because uh, that's what presidents do. Um, and yeah. it's clear that Washington labored over that letter. Um, some people think Thomas Jefferson 
also had a role in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was important enough that they made sure that American newspapers would publish um, uh, the letter. And there's a second piece that's not as often quoted as the wonderful line, still yes. worth reading that you did, but he also talks about toleration. And he mm -hmm. says, it's not just toleration in America. I, it, it's an inherent natural right, religious liberty. There was no place on the planet that mm. said religious liberty is an inherent natural right. And that was hugely important because if it's toleration, well, today we tolerate you and tomorrow we stop tolerating you. We change the law, uh, which happened to Jews all the time. If it's an inherent yeah, natural it's, uh, now no more right. to tolerate. Yeah, it's that. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class. That another enjoys its inherent natural right. Yeah. It, um, and uh, it's really a remarkable mm, yes. um, formulation. It's hard, and, and I think has had a big impact. Uh, I'm very interested in the fact that that letter is quoted all the way um, uh, to our own time. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg quoted it when he allowed a Muslim uh, chapel to be opened at the site of 9-11, of what was called Ground Zero. He cited that letter. And you can find it hmm. cited over and yeah. over as yeah. um, what we aspire to. Hmm. Uh, in uh, in America, right? Um, and uh, I, I I mean Washington wrote a great many letters uh, to different groups, but I think there is a general consensus uh, mm. that this was the most important one uh, with implications for religious liberty forever after. Def definitely is and. He um, goes on to talk about that they had addressed, by the way, Moses Seishas, who was one who presented the Jewish community. He also was there for the Masons. That is, he was with both of these delegations right. greeting right. the president. Right, the Masonic letter is not interesting, but it is no. interesting that a Jew, um, mm -hmm. uh, s Jews brought Spanish Rite Masonry, I think, uh, to Newport, and it's oh. interesting in Europe, often Jews were excluded by the Masons, but in America, you had a great many Masons um, who were Jews. There were places uh, that didn't admit Jews and debated in in the 19th century. But as you say, Moses Satius, whose brother was the, we call him the Chazan, he was the minister uh, in uh, New York and late Philadelphia, and then again New York, uh, so he would, this was a very well connected uh, family, and descendants are still with us today. Hmm. Interesting. And, and then what that they address him as they're from the stock of Abraham. So in his closing, he talks about them as may the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree. By the way, which is something Washington often talked about yearning to do. And that was the purpose of the revolution, to let each of us sit under your own vine and fig tree. Right. That, of course, uh, is not and Washington. And there shall be none to make him afraid. Make him afraid. Uh, that, that's uh, a prophetic uh, uh, allusion uh, it's from the book of Micah. Uh, um, uh, and um, it was George Washington's yeah. favorite biblical verse, as you comment on. He used it all the time. I want to go back to yeah. Mount Vernon, yeah. sit under my own vine and fig tree. And how amazing that a man takes his favorite biblical verse and wishes that others would share it. It's not just that I want to be able to sit under my own vine and fig tree. I want 
Jews and minorities, yeah. uh, even persecuted ones, to sit under their own yes. vine and uh, and fig tree, and that too is going to become important uh, during the debates over Mormonism uh, later. I found uh, someone mm -hmm. who cited the same verse: "Let the Mormons sit under their own vine and fig tree." Wow. It's amazing. Amazing. Well, there's a Thank great you. We're, we're talking with Jonathan Sarna. It, yes. Yeah, it, it really, certainly is. And that is, tells us what the revolution meant to those who were fighting it, what the purpose really was. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're, we're talking with Jonathan Sarna, professor of history at uh, Brandeis University. Now, one character a little bit after the revolutionary period, but I think his story is very telling, is uh, Mordecai Noah, who is a fascinating character, uh, playwright, journalist, uh, proponent of a Jewish community on the Niagara River, also briefly American consul to Tunis in, in 1815. I know you've, writ you've written a book about him. Um, I've just looked at him and thought, what a fascinating story this is. Right. And he is uh, all these born after just after the revolution, 1785. Uh, it's clear that he feels well, thanks to this revolution. I could be both an American politician and a Jew. I don't have to choose between my identities, I can be both. And he is in his day probably the most prominent American Jew. He speaks out. He's a newspaper editor. Uh, he writes plays that are are widely performed and so on. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, and he's in both worlds. Um, uh, uh, there, it's interesting. He's, of course, recalled uh, from Tunis. Um, and it, it's perfectly clear, as I say in the book, he was actually recalled because the government wasn't happy with the way he handled a hostage release. It sounds very contemporary. They thought he overpaid. But mm -hmm. instead of saying that, because everything about hostage releases is secret then and now, they recall him because, well, he's a Jew and the Bay of Tunis uh, might not appreciate having a Jew there, uh, which probably wasn't true. But there was a storm um, when it mm. when that when uh, uh, James um, uh, Madison, uh, I think it was Madison, uh, uh, issues yes. that, and, um, and not only does Noah write a whole protest, but there are other protests by uh, 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 Jews. And they quote George Washington's letter. Yeah. I thought you said bigotry, no mm -hmm. sanction, persecution. What difference does it make if he's a Jew or not a Jew? Mm -hmm. And the administration has quickly to backtrack. No, it had nothing to do with that. Uh, you yeah. know, we um, uh, we recalled him for what we considered to be cause. But never again, to my knowledge, is an American diplomat of officially recalled uh, because uh, his religion uh, uh, wasn't comfortable uh, to the foreign country. And in, indeed, Abraham Lincoln faced the problem when one of his diplomats was accused by the country of having uh, you know, Jewish ancestry and they wouldn't accept him. And Lincoln sent the man somewhere else in the diplomatic corps uh, to Denmark, which had a different name then, uh, and um, uh, uh, you know was not at all interested in hearing about about discrimination uh, against people because mm. of their background. Hmm. Interesting. We're, we're talking with Jonathan Sarna, professor of. Um, University professor and the Joseph and Bell Braun Professor of American and Jewish History at Brandeis. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit, we've talked a bit about the impact that Jews had on the revolution. What about the impact of the revolution itself on 
Jews or on Judaism, on its practice or on the Jewish community beyond the borders of the United States or within the borders of the United States? And I, I, I have to say that I think um, the impact on Jews is more important even than um, uh, the, the impact uh, that Jews had. Uh, it creates um, new norms. Uh, the Constitution creates norms. Uh, suddenly, religious freedom church-state separation, denominationalism. In other words, we no longer allow um, uh, a, a state religion. Uh, there's a no establishment clause. Every denomination is equal, including Judaism. Well, those ideas are new. They're new to everybody, but in uh, the ensuing years, we see Judaism changed in America, and um, it, it tries to meet the needs of young Jews like Mordecai Noah, born after the revolution, uh, who inhaled this atmosphere of freedom and democracy and religious ferment. Um, and in the 1820s, we have what is really a great revolution. We move from um, a synagogue community, meaning one synagogue in all of those communities I mentioned in the beginning, and suddenly they, people break away from synagogues, just like Methodists and Baptists and so on are going to break away mm -hmm. uh, from churches. And they say, hey, it's a free country. We can... Uh, uh, create our own way of being Jewish. We can call ourselves reform. And the government has no interest. And indeed, uh, by the Civil War, practically every Jewish community, by then 150,000 Jews, has multiple synagogues reflecting different traditions. And there, there's nothing <laughs> like that in other countries. So uh, the, the revolution it really reminds us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the revolution really it rem reshapes Judaism. Yeah. It's a fascinating story about, I mean, it really does remind us of how important this event was in kind of philosophical terms and in terms of uh, what it means. The fact that this religious freedom extends not just to Protestants or dissenters and not just to Christians, but to Jews, Muslims, others who are able to enjoy, as sit under their own vine and fig tree, as Washington reminded them. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that that's absolutely right, and um, uh, it was particularly important for religious groups that historically had suffered in different places, uh, and they, of course, were the first to write to Washington. So there's letters from Quakers and Catholics and so on. Washington uh, reassures them that there's a place. And, uh, uh, you know, America at its best, not always at its best, but America at its best is going to look back at these revolutionary uh, traditions and say, ah, uh, that's uh, how minority faiths and minority groups generally should uh, be treated. Mm hmm. Yes, we, we've been talking with Jonathan Sarna, who is the, a university professor, as well as the Joseph H. and Bell R. Braun Professor of American Jewish History and Director of the Schl Schlusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University. Been at Brandeis now for quite a while, 20 years. Or... No, no, not much longer than that, since 1990. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's uh, good. Yeah. Um, 
and author, uh, author, editor, co-author of about uh, three dozen books and co-editor of three different series of books on uh, Jewish history and American Jewish history and uh, former president of the Association for Jewish Studies, as well as chief historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really been conversation. A I've learned a lot. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate yeah. it. I want to thank our producer, Jonathan Lane. Yeah, it's been great to talk to you, uh, Jonathan Lane, our producer. And I want to thank, we have you know listeners, viewers, actually all over the world. It's been interesting talking to folks from different parts of the world and sharing this. And so every week I thank people in different areas who are tuning in. So this week in Newbury in West Berkshire, as well as Newbury in Massachusetts and New Delhi and Mount Olive, North Carolina and Concord in Massachusetts and Concord in North Carolina, Clifton Park, New York, Watertown, Massachusetts, and all places beyond and between. Thanks for joining us. And now these places and would like to get some of our Revolution 250 gear, send Jonathan Lane an email, jlane at revolution250.org. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thanks for joining us.